Good morning. Uh, thank you, TK, for morning, joining Professor us this morning. Um, I would like to start off by asking you a question about CLP Group. So, as we know, CLP was founded in Hong Kong more than a century ago now, uh, and uh, the home base for the group is still Hong Kong. Now, as a Hong Kong-based uh, operation, in what ways uh, does CLP Group contribute to and influence regional and also perhaps global uh, initiatives, especially in the field of sustainable business development? Yeah, um, thank you. So, uh, first of all, you know, CLP was established in 1901, so it's already uh, been more than 120 years. So we started in Hong Kong, and gradually then we also expanded to mainland China, and then starting in the 90s, we started expanding to uh, uh, Australia and also Southeast Asian countries and India. So right now, we, you know, our coverage basically is in this uh, you know, Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and you know, Hong Kong, mainland China, Australia and India are our four uh, key geographical areas. So uh, now over the years, because of, you know, of different requirements, you know, sustainability actually has, has always been our you know, uh, uh, key strategy. So we have to make sure that our, our business is sustainable because our, our vision is to become a leading energy provider in the Asia Pacific region from one generation to the next. That means our business has to be sustainable. So, you know, in the, in the past, uh, I would say past decade, we have been investing a lot in renewable energy in, in this country. So as a leading, you know, uh, energy provider in this region, or we want to be a, like a role model to demonstrate to other industry players, sustainability is, is really important. And secondly, I think, um, in terms of uh, reporting, uh, CLP has been doing uh, quite good and also be a pioneer you know, in this industry. For example, uh, we have this um, climate-related um, uh, kind of a financial disclosure requirements. Uh, so when it was first uh, introduced, so there is no such kind of so-called mandatory requirement. Now Hong Kong is now talking about the mandatory requirement, but CLP has been voluntarily, uh, you know, following the the reporting requirement. So we want to be, you know, uh, transparent. We want to be, you know, demonstrating that we are taking a leading role in this area. So I hope, like you know, doing the investment, uh, being more transparent, have you know better disclosure. Uh, we want to have also some positive influence you know, to other players in this region. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing to hear. I mean, especially in the context of environmental sustainability, mm -hmm. right? When we hear about power generation, most of us still think about the old style fossil fuel burning kind of power plants. So um, as far as CL CLP Group is concerned, you know, how do you address this, uh, this kind of, you know, uh, not just the image, but also the actual generation of power moving away from, from fossil fuels? Uh, what kind of uh, 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 actions have, has CLP Group been taking? Uh, the second part of the question, I guess, uh, is, is related to, to, to what future generations of business leaders have to think about. Mm -hmm. Do you think these kinds of issues about environmental and other types of sustainability issues will continue to be top of mind of global business leaders? Yeah, I think definitely. You know, this will be top of mind of, of every you know, uh, enterprise leaders around the world. Now for CLP, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, sustainability is always our you know, strategy. So uh, actually we are one of the uh, first uh, privately owned uh, electricity and, and, and utility in this region who voluntarily uh, you know, um, publish our own so-called climate vision. So we call it Climate Vision 2050. So we first published it in 2007. At that time, I remember actually, although you know, climate, climate change is still a, a hot topic, but it was not like now where everybody basically has set their own target. At that time, people were just talking about it. Okay, But, but then we already voluntarily uh, announce our own targets. So at that time, we have set a target, you know, of reducing 80% uh, of our carbon intensity uh, by 2050. And then, you know, every now and then we take a look at the, you know, requirements at, you know, basically the, 
different requirements from different stakeholders and also the, the climate change agenda. So we review our climate you know, uh, vision 2050 from time to time. And uh, just back in two, 2021, uh, we have further tightened you know, the, the whole you know, targets. So we have committed to uh, net zero uh, emission by 2050. And there are also some interim targets, like you know, uh, before 2040, we we'll basically will get rid of coal generation. Yeah, so, so all these are you know, our commitment and also give us a clear roadmap to guide our business strategy uh, going forward. That's, that's also you know, amazing to hear because it, it demonstrates a very clear path to get from where we are now to where we would like to be. Um, compared to other power generating uh, utilities around the world, would you say CIAC Group is showing them the way? Uh, I hope that we, we are doing something, you know, bringing positive impact to the industry. That, that, you know, that's exactly what we want to do. Okay, great. Now, um, uh, talking about a slightly different topic, mm. uh, I know you are a chartered engineer mm. and your training uh, started off as an engineer. And then later on, you took up uh, management and leadership role uh, in CLP Group. And mm. now you've been entrusted to be the CEO, the chief executive officer. Uh, so taking into account uh, your own path from mm. your perspective, how important do you think formal management education is in uh, developing leadership qualities? Yeah, uh, now first of all, I think um, uh, continuous development is always, you know, uh, we, we support. Uh, so within the company, you know, continuous, continuous learning is something that we want our, you know, colleagues to continue to do. Uh, and, you know, from a professional engineer, kind of like, you know, um, uh, being developed into you know management positions and also you know senior executives, um, you know from my own personal experience, I think having you know management training as well as you know leadership training, you know are, are both critical. So within you know, within our you know business, uh, we have been doing our you know internal kind of management training and development programs. Uh, some of them are doing like in house through, for example, you know, our own colleagues who, who could be mentors to those uh, you know, uh, other, other colleagues being trained, uh, or, or we can partner with some other external education you know, institutions to provide executive training programs. So we have been running this program, you know, I think maybe since 20 years ago. Okay? And uh, of course, we also have uh, what we call like kind of self-initiated uh, uh, training uh, program where we will give uh, some subsidies to our colleagues who are interested to take external public courses. Uh, actually, I, I, I was one of the uh, you know, uh, uh, colleagues that benefit from this okay. program because when I uh, you know, joined the uh, CU uh, you know, MBA program you know, quite, quite some time ago, I, I also participated in this program and I received some subsidy from the company, which is a great encouragement for me to, to continue to learn. Uh, and internally, we also have a uh, what we call a management succession uh, planning uh, uh, initiative. That means, for you know, really senior executives, we want to have a clear plan, you know, to identify some targeted you know colleagues, and we then focus you know our resources to groom those colleagues to become future leaders. Mm -hmm. From what I'm hearing, it sounds like you know leadership qualities in your mind. You know they are really leadership skills. Mm -hmm. They are things we can learn, mm -hmm. right? Even if you know when we look around us and there are many leaders we admire, it's not necessarily the case that leaders are born that way, right? It sounds like you know there is a role for education and training to develop you know our colleagues into the, the, those types of people we want them to be. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know a lot of the time actually people might not. I would say, you know, based on my experience, some of, sometimes people may not realize his or her own potential. Uh, you know, because of different background, you know, when, when you kind of like grow up, you may not be given the opportunities to really understand yourself, to really unleash your, your potential. So through these different kinds of program, uh, I think it would be a good, you know, opportunity to really uh, make our people understand themselves, unleash their potential. Uh, so, so I think that's also very important. And, and on top of that, apart from our internal kind of you know, training and development program, we also establish 
a uh, what we call CLP Power Academy. Now, this academy is actually for the industry uh, because we see the, the importance of you know if we have a healthy you know kind of industry, it's not only for the benefit of you know my own company but also you know for the society. So the academy actually organizes different types of courses uh, from diploma, professional diploma, you know bachelor degree course to master degree course. Uh, and we are now also thinking about like leadership development programs uh, that can help you know basically uplift the whole you know uh, level of the, uh, the practitioners in this industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, you know again something like very interesting to to learn about. Mm -hmm. um, so another topic I want to bring up with you, uh, we talk about it a lot lately. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of the Greater Bay Area, mm -hmm. of which Hong Kong is part. Um, I was just curious to learn, you know, within CLP Group, how do you view this idea of the Greater Bay Area, and uh, you know what what role do you anticipate the group playing in the future to take forward this idea? Yeah. Now, first of all, I think, um, as a matter of fact, you know, Greater Bay Area is a very, very important and, and, and big market. Now, just maybe, you know, I don't have all the detailed numbers, but if I can remember, you know, the whole GBA, we have about almost like 90 million uh, population. And in terms of, you know, GDP, uh, it's like one of the like, top 10 kind of largest, uh, you know, uh, economic kind of regions uh, in the world. So it's such an important uh, market. So, so definitely there are many, many opportunities. Uh, and uh, another um, important consideration is a lot of the, you know, companies, you know, uh, businesses in Hong Kong, uh, they have their own setup in Hong Kong, but they also have, you know, other like production facilities or different activities in the GBA. Uh, so. So actually, we see um, uh, one of the key, I would say, strategy for us, for CLP, is to leverage the relationship with our customer in Hong Kong. And when they you know, go to GBA, we can also extend our services to the GBA, uh, their facilities there. Uh, now, one example is uh, even for shopping malls. Now, some of the developers in Hong Kong, we have been providing uh, energy management services to them in Hong Kong, uh, including some, uh, you know, we call it like energy as a service, or even what we call cooling as a, as a service, kind of a new business model in Hong Kong. And after successful, you know, experience in Hong Kong, they also have a lot of different kind of shopping malls in the Victor Bay area. And they will like us to follow them, to go to those areas and introduce the same kind of solutions to improve their energy uh, efficiency in, in those business operations. So I, I see this as a, a key uh, you know, opportunity for us and also helping our customer, uh, not only to improve their business operation uh, efficiency, but also help them decarbonize. Because I think uh, ESG is everything, everybody's agenda nowadays. So apart from like following our customers you know, you know, to GBA, uh, which is obviously an important um, approach in our business strategy. Another important you know, approach is to work directly with the local government. Now, for example, in Shenzhen, uh, we work with the Longhua district uh, you know, government. We sign an MOU with them uh, so that we can work together with them to introduce this kind of uh, you know, ESG initiatives to benefit the businesses in, in their district. It's, it's, it's very interesting to hear you describe it this way, following the customers, mm -hmm. because I think to most of us, when we think about CLP Group, we think about the customers as consumers of electricity, of power, right? But what I just heard you talk about is, it's also the know-how, right? The knowledge about how to run their shopping malls or whatever other operations they have, how to do it in the best efficient way, especially with this decarbonization objective, right? Everyone is kind of aiming for. I was also curious because you talked about the customers. How about the supplier side of things? Like, like, do you think CFP Group has a lot of influence to, you know, for example, to to push some of their suppliers to to be more aggressive towards meeting their own decarbonization targets? For example, is, is there a role for a, a business like CFP to play there? 
Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we do have a role to play because now first of all, we can demonstrate you know, to the industry that this is everybody's responsibility to decarbonize. Now maybe I, I give you an example how CLP is trying to decarbonize our product first. Now, um, I, I mentioned to you about the uh, Climate Vision 2050. So we set a target of net zero, arriving at net zero by 2050. So in all the markets that we are now operating, we have set uh, you know, specific uh, plans to decarbonize our electricity. For example, in Hong Kong, uh, we work with the Hong Kong government and the whole decarbonization basically is divided into like three stages. The first stage is to replace coal with gas, which we are about to complete early next year. And apart, you know, after the first stage, then the second stage will be try to develop more zero carbon energy, uh, including nuclear and renewable energy. Uh, but because of the limitation in Hong Kong, so we have looked for regional cooperation, so bringing those zero carbon energy from like Guangdong province or the uh, South China region to Hong Kong. And then you know, the last stage probably will need some technological advancement, for example, uh, green hydrogen, so that we can convert our gas generation plant in Hong Kong to become zero carbon. So this is a roadmap we are now working on uh, with the Hong Kong government. In some of the other um, uh, markets, for example, in uh, mainland China and also in India. So we're focusing on uh, developing renewable energy uh, projects so, so as to help uh, these countries to achieve their own decarbonization target. Now in Australia, it's a little bit complicated. So apart from renewable energy projects, we are also uh, working on what we call the firming capacity projects. That means because of the proliferation of uh, you know, renewable energy projects, we need some facilities to help stabilize the, the, uh, the power system. So for example, battery storage or pump hydro storage uh, projects. So we are now focusing on these, uh, so what we call the firming capacity. So different markets, we have different kinds of uh, initiative or projects to help achieve the decarbonization target. Now, so after we demonstrate our own initiative to decarbonize, then we'll ask our supplier also to you know, follow suit, you know, to, to basically doing the same in decarbonizing. One of the key sources of uh, carbon emission is electricity consumption. So if we can demonstrate to them that we are doing our part in decarbonization and actually you know, helping them also to decarbonize already, and then for those kind of remaining parts of carbon emission, uh, I think it's their responsibility to continue to work out the solution to decarbonize. It's very interesting to, to hear to listen about all of these. Uh, so one of the um, um, one of the important messages I just heard was in achieving these uh, objectives, twenty fifty and so on. Technology is going to play a big role, mm. right? Because without the advancements in the technology, it would be much harder to achieve these targets. So you know, like thinking futuristically a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> what do you think will be some of the most important technologies? that might have an impact to help us get there. Mm. Yeah, now I think in the uh, short to medium term, definitely renewable energy technology, nuclear technology, uh, I would say the key. Uh, and among the renewable energy technologies, there are many, many different types, wind uh, generation, so different kinds of wind turbine technology. Uh, the size of wind turbine is now getting bigger and bigger, so as to make the whole thing more efficient. Uh, and solar uh, PV technology also. Um, and then nuclear generation, we are now talking about the third generation uh, nuclear technology and people are now working on the fourth generation and even nuclear fusion, uh, which would be definitely more promising. Now, these are the, the short to medium term uh, kind of technology. But then at the same time, we need to th think about some other uh, technologies that I mentioned for longer term. For example, hydrogen, green hydrogen. Uh, now, in terms of so-called technological uh, uh, kind of development, um, these you know, so-called hydrogen uh, technology are not totally new. For example, hydrogen production basically is, I would say, old technology. It's a matter of cost. How do we make it more efficient? But then for um, hydrogen transportation, uh, there are some new technology development there. 
for hydrogen consumption, uh, we are having such technology, but we need some more, you know, advancement. So, so you know, hydrogen definitely is one, and then another one is carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, right now, you know, people are also you know adding one more character we call it utilization. That means if we want to like uh, capture those uh, uh, carbon and then basically store it in a permanent way, uh, storing is one approach, but turning it into a product is another way of storing carbon. So utilization is a key. So people now are talking about carbon capture, utilization and sequestration. So CCUS uh, is another technology. So I definitely, I think different kinds of technology will help uh, you know, to facilitate this more challenging, longer term decarbonization. That, that was great. Um, so thank you very much, uh, TK, uh, for these great insights. Uh, I hope our listeners also learned a lot, just as I did. Thank you again. No, thank you. Thank you, Professor Wen.